Section one of Mrs. Piozzi's Thraliana, with numerous extracts hitherto unpublished, by Charles Hughes. Quote, Strange that a woman should write such a book as this. Put down every occurrence of her life, every emotion of her heart, and call it a Thraliana, forsooth. But then I mean to destroy it. Unquote. Hester Thrale, 10th of December, 1780. There are two authorities for Dr. Johnson's conversations, and especially for his conversations at Streatham, who have a claim to be considered by the side of Boswell. These are Miss Burney, afterwards Madame D'Arblay, and Mrs. Thrale, afterwards Mrs. Piozzi. Yet I suppose that Boswell has been read by fifty persons, for every reader of Madame D'Arblay's diary, and that Madame D'Arblay has been read by at least fifty, for every faithful student who has read Mrs. Piozzi's books, or the two volumes published in 1861 by Mr. Abraham Haywood, in which Mrs. Piozzi obtains a full hearing, and in which were first published extracts from Thraliana. There were two editions of Mr. Haywood's work published in 1861, in the first, a large slice of Thraliana is inserted en masse, and not properly incorporated with the work. It had evidently been received from Mr. Salisbury, son of Piozzi's nephew and owner of the precious manuscript, just before publication. For the second edition, a large edition had been received from Mr. Salisbury, containing most intimate and vivid passages, and all these, and the preceding instalment of Thraliana, are incorporated in the first volume. Without speaking disrespectfully of Haywood's work, which was carried out under great difficulties, it may be said that the contributions of Mr. Salisbury far outweigh in value the rest of the volumes as new and authoritative matter interesting to the Johnson Boswell amateur. They are absolutely necessary to anyone who wishes to, quote, see Boswell's Johnson steadily and to see it whole, unquote. Mr. Salisbury told Mr. Haywood that he deemed Thraliana, quote, of too private and delicate character to be submitted to strangers, unquote, and since he supplied those, quote, curious, Unquote, passages unquote, in 1861, no more of it has been published. Mr. L. B. Seeley was allowed to use Haywood's materials in his Life of Mrs. Thrale, and has recognised the importance of the Thraliana extracts. They have also caused Mrs. Thrale's case with regard to her marriage to be fairly stated by Sir Leslie Stephen in his little book on Johnson in the English Men of Letters series and in the Dictionary of National Biography. Those who have only read Boswell are quite unable to understand Mrs. Thrale's position and the inevitable unfairness of Boswell with regard to her. The unfairness was inspired not merely by literary jealousy but by a personal grudge to one who had known Johnson longer and more intimately, and loved him better. This is only a proof of the sincerity of Boswell, and in no respects affects the greatness of his literary genius, which is the main cause of our personal interest in Johnson. Thirty years ago, I collected books relating to Boswell's Johnson, and have long looked upon Thraliana as one of the few possible sources of fresh human interest about the Johnson circle. It was therefore a great pleasure and surprise to me to have the opportunity of perusing Thraliana from end to end. These six folio volumes, substantially bound and lettered Thraliana, each containing from 250 to 300 pages, were commenced on the 15th of September, 1776, by the following entry. Quote, it is many years since Dr. Samuel Johnson advised me to get a little book 
and write in it all the anecdotes which might come to my knowledge, all the observations which I might make or hear, all the verses never likely to be published, and, in fine, everything which struck me at the time. Mr. Thrale has now treated me with a repository, and provided it with the pompous title Thraliana. I must endeavour to fill it with nonsense, new and old. End quote. While Thraliana was at my house, it was insured against fire for five thousand pounds. Nor could I say when I had perused it that the amount was excessive as things go today. It is the intimate record of her life from 1776 to 1809 by the bright and brilliant lady who was the hostess and caretaker of Johnson for eighteen years and was the friend of Johnson's friends, Reynolds, Garrick, Burke, Baretti, Burney, Boswell, and whose second marriage with Piozzi was the result of an irresistible passion in no way discreditable to her and based on mutual affection and esteem. She was in a position to record interesting things, and she does record the most candidly and faithfully, and used to read and re-read Thraliana to the end of her life. Only three leaves had she cut out, which relate to the time when she broke off with Piozzi and sent him to Italy, but she has frequently annotated and supplemented the record by side notes, which are sometimes of extreme interest. It is all in a plain, bold handwriting that can be read with ease, and a great deal of it has to do with forgotten scandals about her own relatives and other comparatively unimportant people. These help to make it a faithful reflection of eighteenth-century life, but are often unsuitable for publication. When such prodigious prices are paid for a Chinese vase, a Renaissance bronze, a houdon bust and a rock crystal biberon it seems to me that it would be among the less insane of the caprices of millionaires if one who loved boswell were to pay five thousand ten thousand or fifteen thousand pounds for the manuscript of mrs piozzi's thraliana for something absolutely unique there is no such thing as a market value but let Thraliana speak for itself, and begin with an entry about Sir Joshua Reynolds and his sister. Quote, I have fancied lately that there was something of this nature, jealousy, between Sir Joshua and Miss Reynolds. He certainly does not love her as one should expect a man to love a sister he has so much reason to be proud of. Perhaps she paints too well or she has learned too much Latin and is a better scholar than her brother. And upon reflections, I think it must be so. For if he only did not like her as an inmate, why should he not give her a genteel annuity and let her live where or how she likes? The poor lady is always miserable, always fretful, and she seems resolved, nobly enough, not to keep her post by flattery, if she cannot keep it by kindness. This is a flight so far beyond my power that I respect her for it, and do love dearly to hear her criticise Sir Joshua's painting, or indeed his connoisseurship, which I think she always does with justice and judgment, mingled now and then with a bitterness that diverts one. End quote. It was evidently a pleasure to Mrs. Thrale to hear attacks on the genius of Reynolds, whose quote, invulnerability, unquote, was probably as tedious to her as the virtue of Aristides to the ostracizing Greeks. Northcote says that nothing made Sir Joshua so mad as Miss Reynolds' portraits, which were an exact imitation of all his defects. There are few references to Goldsmith, but Thraliana was not begun till two years after Goldsmith's death. But Mrs. Thrale gives the following anecdote at second hand. Quote, Mrs. Montague says, 
she was vastly struck with Goldsmith the first time they met. It was at some great table, I forget what, but Lady Abercorn was there, a lady of about seventy-six or eighty years old, and the company, remarking how young she looked, were led to mention her age and apply to the doctor. "'I am no great judge,' says Goldsmith, "'for I never saw an old woman before, "'except I mean an apple woman or a beggar woman or some such body. "'Ladies always look young. "'I think, for they are finely dressed up. "'So I can't tell whether this lady looks well for her age or no. "'Tis a new species to me.' End quote. A caricature drawing of Goldsmith by Bunbury is pasted in the first volume of Thraliana. The following anecdote, recorded March 1777, must not perhaps be taken as anything but a good tale. An Oxford satire on the slender examination tests of 18th century Parsons. Quote, Dr. Parker once told a story of a young fellow at Oxford who went for ordination to the famous Martin Benson and returned rejected and, of course, looking foolish enough. How is this? cried his tutor. Why were you not ordained as we expected? I don't know, replied the other. Why, he asked me some cramp questions which I did not half understand. What question, said the tutor. Why, says the boy, he asked me, who was the great mediator between God and man? And what was your reply? Why, says the young fellow, after a moment's consideration, I named the Archbishop of Canterbury. Lockhead, exclaims the tutor. Didn't you know that the Archbishop and Benson have had a quarrel? If you had named any other bishop on the bench, it would have been done. End quote. The Martin Benson of this story was created Bishop of Gloucester in 1752 and is regarded as one of the most learned and pious of 18th century bishops. Many of them had learning, but very few were remarkable for piety. Readers of Boswell feel very well acquainted with Bennet Langton and his wife, the Countess of Rothers, but even the indiscreet Boswell could not write quite so freely for the public as Mrs. Thrale in the privacy of Thraliana. She gives a very amusing description of the wasteful and shiftless ways of Bennet Langton's father and mother, which she must have heard from Johnson and which I omit with some reluctance and then begins on Langton himself and his wife, Lady Rothers. Quote, this Mr. Langton, however, was to have repaired the fortune of the family and married a rich wife. For well, he is pious, learned and elegant and well qualified to make his addresses to any lady. To the grief and astonishment of all his true friends, they now behold him tied to a thing without beauty, birth, money or talents, widowed to an old Scotch peer who wanted a son in his old age and took a fresh lowland lass for that purpose with more probability than success. She is a Presbyterian too to make her more fit for Langton who was a Tory and high churchman up to the eyes. But that, as he observes, is a small fault for, says he, I shall take her to church and she will go, of course, and not to find out the difference. She does so, and they seem to live vastly happy as can be, and ask their friends to dine with them, lords, ladies, anybody, upon a piece of boiled beef and a loin of veal only, without anything else. All this with an insensibility truly admirable. August the 13th, 1777 Yesterday I dined at Sir Joshua Reynolds' Richmond Hill. Some agreeable people were raked together and we intended to have a charming day of it. But Mr. Garrick was sick and Lady Rothes was troublesome. She brought the babies with her, both under six years old, which, though the prettiest babies in the world, were not wanted there at all. They played and prattled and suffered nobody to be heard but themselves. 
we ancient maids sterile wives and disappointed parents were peevish to see others happier than ourselves and a little boy who naughty as we called him three people there would have been glad to purchase with ten thousand pounds garrick thrale and old deputy patterson who married a second wife on purpose but could not obtain his wish End quote. it ought to be mentioned to justify mrs thrale's description of herself as a disappointed parent that she had lost both her sons by death and had only daughters living as these extracts from thraliana are given in order of time as they were entered by mrs thrale in her volumes they must inevitably appear scrappy and they jump from one subject to another but this gives the same effect as does the actual reading of thraliana which is something between a diary and a commonplace book and is a delightful jumble of family troubles gossip scandal political events amusing tales and serious reflections i do not remember having seen elsewhere a tale told by johnson about garrick when he first appeared as king richard in london a rich and noble lady fell in love with him and sent a go-between to propose marriage but the proposals dropped and it was only after a year or so that garrick met the intermediary and discovered the cause Quote, well she said the truth is the best excuse i will tell you my friend fell in love with you playing king richard but seeing you since in the character of the lying valet you looked so shabby pardon me sir that it cured her of her passion End quote. Mrs. Thrale records a smart saying of her own when she was in Paris at the time of the outbreak of the American Rebellion. She has used it in one of her published works. Quote, a French gentleman, whose place was near mine at the opera, asked me in a sneering manner how we should do to conquer America, adding that he fancied it would be somewhat difficult. Perhaps so, I replied, now tis defended by Englishmen. I remember it was easy enough to take it from the French. End quote. The following description of Mr. Cumberland proves that Sheridan did not overdraw his caricature in so fretful plagiary in the critic. Quote, Mr. Cumberland's delicacy is very troublesome his peevishness very teasing, and his envy very hateful. He looks to me like a man that has been poisoned, so sallow is his complexion, and so sunk are his eyes. Yet his person is genteel, and his manner elegant, but he professes to be easily galled, and says of himself that he was born without a skin effeminacy is however an odious quality in the creature and when joined with a low jealousy actually detestable he is a man one cannot love End quote. i suppress a rather scandalous note annexed to this passage by mrs piozzi at a later date as an introduction to an account of a conversation on love with dr johnson in which he expressed his usual common sense and unromantic views, she remarks, quote, As my peace has never been disturbed by the soft passion, so it seldom comes into my head to talk of it. End quote. During this conversation, Johnson defended all amusements as combating the tedium vitae. Quote, Cards, dress, dancing all found their advocates in johnson somebody would say such a lady never touches a card how then does she get rid of her time says johnson does she drink drams such a person never suffers gentlemen to buzz in his daughter's ears who is to buzz in her ears then the footman End quote. 
The following tale may be recommended to the members of the Anti-Vivisection Society, and it will be all the more suitable for them, as it bears the marks of exaggeration and imagination. Quote, a fellow brought his dog to a doctor for dissection. Pray, friend, inquires the doctor, is not that the dog which once saved your life? And have you the cruelty to bring him here to be dissected? Well, really, answers the clown, I do believe the poor beast loves me so, that if he knowed I should get a crown by it, he would have come voluntary. End quote. Mrs. Thrale has written in these volumes several tales unfit to tell in a mixed company, but we must remember that this was a private record, and that she had possibly heard some of these smoke-room stories from Thrale in private. And then, of course, the 18th century was not precisely mid-Victorian. She had, however, her own strong feelings of propriety. Quote, at a dinner party at Mr. Deputy Patterson, his wife insisted on reciting some impromptu verses which her husband had composed at the age of seventy-two in honour of a reigning beauty. They were repeated with great gravity and in a theatrical tone. When Daphne fled Apollo's arms and in a laurel veiled her charms, his godship longed to bark her. So I do hate the nuzzling pride of lace and gauze that strive to hide the charms of Kitty Parker. Editor's note, Mrs. Thrale writes out four more stanzas, back to main text. Well, now to be sure, these verses are very happy, very sprightly, very clever, considering they were run off all impromptu. But they are such verses as I should have thought no lady would have repeated in mixed company. End quote. Nevertheless, Mrs. Thrale must have asked Mrs. Patterson for a copy of those charming verses, for she would hardly have been able to carry them in her memory from a single hearing. Mrs. Thrale has written in these pages a long account of her own family, much of which has been published by Haywood, but that gentleman was not entrusted by Mr. Salisbury with the following account of the diarist's own father, Mr. John Salisbury, of Bachy Craig, who seems to have been rather like one of the heroes of Fielding's novels. Quote, My father, turning out a wild young fellow with spirit to spend money and earnest desire to give it away whenever it seemed to be wanted, and soon very little to spend or give, and resolved to come to London and try his fortune, as tis called here, he fell in with a very famous woman, Miss Harriet Edwards, who, having struck out for herself a new plan of happiness, resolved to act the man and the libertine. She was a young person of large and independent fortune, who set reputation at naught and scandal at defiance resolved to avoid marriage and yet have a son on whom to settle her estate. Editor's note. She would be considered quite a forward feminist even now. Back to main text. Took, as I have been told, a fancy to my father whom she supplied with money as long as her taste to his company subsisted, and when they parted, he picked up another female friend, a Mrs. Stradwick, who, being divorced from her husband, led a libertine life till all her pelf was exhausted. When these resources failed my father, he went abroad as Cicerone to his relation, Sir Robert Cotton of Combermere, who paid his expenses and was pleased with his company. The more, perhaps, as he did not suspect the attachment his own sister Hester had to him, and the regular correspondence they had long continued to maintain. My mother became so lovely a creature, both in body and mind, that her brother Sir Robert grew proud of her, and she was always about with him and Lady Betty, who introduced her into gay life when she received many advantageous proposals of marriage. She, however, declined accepting any, 
having secretly set her heart upon her flashy cousin john and when her fortune was settled and she became independent she resolved to bestow it and herself on my father for whose necessities it was by no means sufficient being only seven thousand pounds and an annuity of a hundred and twenty five pounds per annum for the life of her mother the lady cotton who was no longer young and having had two more children by captain king seemed to be quite worn out well my father durst not return with sir robert from france lest this attachment to his sister should be discovered so he stayed at lyon six months with a french marquise who died in his arms and left him the little he had not spent of hers before note the gold-headed cane which i gave mr thrale was a present from that lady with this little money he came home and married miss hester maria cotton his brother sir robert cotton protested he would never see them more End quote. they lived in carnarvonshire in poverty and dissension till the daughter became a link between them quote, rakish men seldom make tender fathers but a man must fumble something and nature pleads her own cause powerfully when a little art is likewise used to help it forward i therefore grew a great favourite it seems in spite of his long continued efforts to dislike me and now that they had a centre of unity in this offspring for which they were both equally interested they began to agree a little better i believe and bear with patience their irrevocable lot and now nine years of mutual misery had been endured when sir robert cotton soured by having no children of his own and disliking to excess the lady whom his next brother and immediate heir had chosen began to hear of his once favourite sister and made overtures of peace during these nine years my mother had never bought but one new gown that cost only one guinea of a peddler that had come about the country she made her own candles salted her own meat ironed her own linen and her husband's and mine and if he could but have been good-humoured protested she would have been happy End quote. as a fair account of mrs thrale's life up to the time of her marriage is given in haywood's and seeley's books it will be unnecessary to give any more extracts about her relatives or the circumstances recorded after fifteen years of her marriage to mr thrale a mariage de raison arranged for her by her mother and uncle it was not an unsuitable marriage but mrs thrale is modest enough to think that one of the chief of her attractions in mr thrale's eyes was her willingness to live much of her life in the house in the borough near the southwark brewery the house at streatham was for thrale rather a suburban than a country house for he was quite determined not to have a quote neighbourhood unquote there but to depend for society on friends from london his old bachelor friends murphy bowdens fitzpatrick captain conway and others were at first the ami de la maison mrs thrale says quote, I liked none of them but Murphy, and my mother despised them all. End quote. But it was Murphy who introduced Johnson, and so made the house famous forever in English literary history. End of section one. Section two of Mrs. Piozzi's Thraliano by Charles Hughes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the end of the second volume of Thraliana, we have a description of Mrs. Thrale's own person and mind, of which I quote the latter. Quote, the character of the mind is, however, almost wholly Italian. Footnote, this was written before she was acquainted with Piozzi. End footnote. Or rather Welsh, perhaps, for her temper is warm even to irascibility affectionate and tender but claiming such returns to her tenderness and affection as busy people have no time to pay and coarse people have no pleasure in paying 
she is a diligent and active friend who spares neither money nor pains to oblige but is soon disgusted if the person obliged does not express the sense of obligation by nature a rancorous and revengeful enemy but having conquered that quality by god's grace she is now apt really and bona fide to forget when and how she was offended End quote. at the beginning of volume three on the nineteenth of may seventeen seventy eight she mentions that the black letter title traliana is written by sophie stretfield but as very full extracts about that fair lady and her flirtations were furnished by mr salisbury to haywood and printed by him they shall not be quoted here it is curious however that she never mentions s s s strange gift of being able to weep real tears at the word of command as a sort of accomplishment which furnishes miss burney with a life-like descriptive passage here follows a most remarkable tabular character sketch of the society of streatham based on a system of marks for different qualities twenty being full marks Quote, johnson religion twenty morality twenty scholarship nineteen general knowledge twenty person and voice zero manners zero wit fifteen humour fifteen good humour zero murphy religion one morality four scholarship fifteen general knowledge six person and voice thirteen manners fifteen wit seventeen humour fifteen good humour fifteen dr burney religion eighteen morality eighteen scholarship eight general knowledge fifteen person and voice thirteen manners sixteen wit zero humour three good humour nineteen garrick religion ten morality fifteen scholarship three general knowledge sixteen person and voice eighteen manners seventeen wit nineteen humour nineteen good humour zero seward religion zero morality seventeen scholarship twelve general knowledge fourteen person and voice nine manners ten wit eighteen humour zero good humour zero boswell religion five morality five scholarship five general knowledge ten person and voice ten manners eight wit seven humour three good humour nineteen bodens religion zero morality zero scholarship zero general knowledge ten person and voice six manners fifteen wit fifteen humour fifteen good humour fifteen thrale religion eighteen morality seventeen scholarship nine general knowledge nine person and voice eighteen manners seventeen wit zero humour zero good humour zero burke religion sixteen morality ten scholarship fourteen general knowledge nineteen person and voice twelve manners fourteen wit zero humour zero good humour zero sir john laid religion zero morality zero scholarship zero general knowledge five person and voice ten 
Manners, nine. Wit, zero. Humour, zero. Good humour, zero. Baretti, religion, zero. Morality, six. Scholarship, six. General knowledge, seventeen. Person and voice, four. Manners, six. Wit, zero. Humour, five. Good humour, zero. Dr. Beatty, religion, eighteen. Morality, eighteen. Scholarship, eleven. General knowledge, seven. Person and voice, seven. Manners, six. Wit, zero. Humour, zero. Good humour, zero. James Harris, religion, zero. Morality, ten. Scholarship, twenty. General knowledge, ten. Person and voice, five. Manners, three. Wit, zero. Humour, zero. Good humour, zero. Langton, religion, eighteen. Morality, eighteen. Scholarship, seventeen. General knowledge, six. Person and voice, five. Wit, zero. Humour, zero. Good humour, zero. Cator, religion, zero. Morality, zero. Scholarship, zero. General knowledge, thirteen. Person and voice, three. Manners, zero. Wit, zero. Humour, zero. Good humour, zero. End quote. It contains a great deal in a small space. The celebrity of some of the persons and the fact that the marks were given by a keen-witted woman who knew them all intimately gives it a quite unique interest. Some of the names in Thraliana are not given here, among others Sir Joshua Reynolds. The reason that Sir Joshua's character is not quoted is that in his case the columns of religion and morality are left blank. This means that as to the religion and morality of the President of the Royal Academy, Mrs Thrale had not been able to make up her mind. It is clear that she did not like him very much, so that her agnosticism as to his religion and morality may be taken as want of sympathy. Quote, By good humour is meant only the good humour necessary to conversation. End quote. Mrs. Thrale evidently meant that combination of good humour and good temper which enables people to stand argument, contradiction and chaff without irritation or resentment. There is another elaborate table, which I do not reproduce, about the lady visitors to Streatham, but the headings are different. Mrs. Thrale remarks, quote, They must possess virtue in the contracted sense, or one would not keep them company. End quote. One of these virtuous dames, however, she suspects of having had an illegitimate child. She gives several remarkable tales of dreams and warnings which she had heard of from others, and one that happened to herself is striking and impressive, though it is impossible to avoid the criticism that it is not entered in Thraliana till more than two years after the event. Quote, when I myself was at Lille in Flanders in the year 1775, I walked with Mr. Johnson and Mr. Thrale round the great church there, and in one of the chapels I observed myself to stumble in an odd manner so as to give me uncommon pain, and at the same time to excite strange ideas of terror wholly unaccountable to me, who am neither timorous nor over-delicate. I looked at the altarpiece and saw it was the figure of an angel protecting a boy about twelve years old, as it should seem, and somehow the child struck me with a resemblance to my own, and alarmed me in an unusual manner. 
I prayed for the safety of my young ones, and as I came out of the chapel, I asked an old man to whom that chapel was dedicated. He replied to the guardian angel of children. I resolved to walk round the church and go into every chapel in it to see if I should stumble in them. I could not stumble, however, but when I returned with better spirits to the children's chapel, I stumbled again and even hurt myself. The impression it made alarmed me, and as I could not rid myself of the uneasiness it caused, I told Mr. Johnson in the afternoon, when Hester was gone to play with her papa, he bid me be careful not to encourage such fancies, and talking the thing through cleared my head a bit for a time. Soon after our return from abroad, however, I was dreadfully alarmed by my son's sudden illness and death. And though he continued ill but three hours, this old superstition haunted me all the while. The more, perhaps, as I had two days before going down to dinner with company, when he was perfectly well at school, heard something like a preternatural voice, that of his guardian angel, perhaps, call me by my name. But this I never mentioned to anyone, lest I should be suspected of madness, but mad I am not. I have the best health in the world. No indigestion, no headaches, no vapours, no change of weather affects me, nor did even the loss of my only son lay stronger hold on my heart than was utterly impossible to avoid. My mind is an act of whirligig mind, which few things can stop to disturb, and if disturbed it soon recovers its strength and its activity. End quote. With this we may compare the following entry, which, for the sake of the contrast, I have taken a little out of its proper order in Thraliana. Quote, 24th of September, 1779, Friday. I've got a strange fit of the horrors upon me today. Something runs in my head that I shall die, or Mr. Thrale shall die, and that we shall not, as we hoped, communicate at God's table next Sunday. I will say nothing of it, for it may end in nothing. But I'm not used to be low-spirited, and it's very odd to be so now, for I ail nothing, though I tremble with terror just as I was before my son died. If nothing does happen, I will never mind low spirits again. Monday, the 4th of October, 1779. Nothing happened. We did communicate together last Sunday, Sen night, and tomorrow we set out for Tunbridge Wells and Brighthamston. End quote. I must now quote a very remarkable passage in which Mrs. Thrale records, in 1779, an account of some great passion or scandal in Johnson's life, to which she makes no further reference in the length and breadth of Thraliana. Quote, it appears to me that no man can live his life quite through without being at some period of it under the dominion of some woman, wife, mistress or friend. Pope and Swift was softened by the smiles of Patty Blunt and Stella. And our own stern philosopher Johnson trusted me about the years 1767 or 1768, I know not which just now, with a secret far dearer to him than his life. Such, however, is his nobleness and such his partiality that I sincerely believe he has never since that day regretted his confidence or ever looked with less kind affection on her who had him in her power. Uniformly great is the mind of that incomparable mortal, and well does he contradict the maxims of Rochefoucauld, that no man is a hero to his valet de chambre. Johnson is more a hero to me than to any one, and I have him more to him for intimacy than ever was any man's valet de chambre. End quote. This furnishes a fine problem for the exercise of a constructive imagination. The fact that this confidence of Johnson's, recorded, it must be remembered, more than ten years after it was given, 
placed him in quote, Mrs. Thrale's power, unquote, proves that it was not a mere flirtation or love affair, but something of which the sage had reason to be ashamed. We must remember that more than ten years elapsed between the death of Johnson's wife and his first acquaintance with either Boswell or the Thrales, and that during this period he passed much of his time in deplorable, and apparently inexcusable, laziness, while supposed to be employed in preparing his edition of Shakespeare. Shortly after he became friendly with Mr. and Mrs. Thrale, they found him in a state of despondency and despair that was akin to madness. Still, we do not know the name of the woman under whose dominion Johnson passed, and it is very much to the credit of Mrs. Piozzi that we do not know it. Boswell could not possibly have kept it back. The following passage is interesting as it shows what a real respect she had for her husband as a politician, while having no illusions whatever as to the general character of the Houses of Parliament. The House of Commons at that time was certainly not a collection of ideal men any more than it is today. Let us hope that today there are wives to be found who believe each of them that her own husband is the one honest man in a rotten and accursed assembly. Mrs. Thrale writes, quote, If we have deserved help from heaven, we shall have it. But let us first inquire whether, peradventure, ten righteous men may be found in the Houses of Parliament. When I say ten righteous men, I mean ten men free from the vice of the place. Note, she makes a comparison with Sodom. End note wholly clear from corruption or bias of any kind, or tied by any interest for their own sakes or their friends to any party whatever. It may, for aught I know, be saved for the sake of such ten, but I only know one myself, and that is Mr. Thrale. 5th of July, 1779. I will now present, as Mr. Froman says, a series of extracts which show Mrs. Thrale's variety of subject and variety of tone, though all written with equal sincerity. One, concerning Pacchiarotti, about whom we hear some scandalous tales in the extracts from Thraliana printed by Haywood. Two, about Mrs. Thrale's efforts in the cause of religion. Three, as to a young admirer at Bath, for a comparison between Gray the poet and Sir Joshua Reynolds the painter. 5. Reflections on a curious manuscript of Pope's with moral observations on the amount of artifice in life. Quote, 1. Fanny Burney goes home now to study and live recluse, and, as I tell her, to kiss Pacchiarotti, the castrato singer of whom they're all so fond. Pacchiarotti said one day to me, when I told him my regard was of little value from my ignorance of music, On the contrary, madam, the hard thing is mine. For how shall I reward your propensity to me if not by my talent? Partiality, said I. I beg pardon, madam, propensity. Comical enough. And so was a note of his in answer to an invitation of mine and Miss Burney's for an evening visit. I pity myself, says he, that I cannot pass the whole night between those two ladies, but I will give them what I can. All this with perfect innocence of any meaning whatsoever. 2. If one can mend anybody's morals or fix anybody's notions of religion, how happy does it make one? Sure, it is not mere vanity in me to fancy that I have helped forward the salvation of my husband, Mrs. Byron, Mrs. Lambert, and Sir P.J. Clarke. My children's souls are in my care, and all I can do for them is indispensable duty. Mr. Scray's footnote, Mrs. Piozzi's trusted friend and business adviser, whom she always found worthy of every confidence, end footnote, is quite unimpressible with any religious notions, for I have worked at him, but I have often observed business disqualifies a man for heaven more than pleasure does. 
the thorny ground seems to be worse than the stony, and the faults which a man applauds in himself he never will be cured of. Now the pleasure hunter always condemns himself, the business hunter quite otherwise. 3. 1780 Bath I have picked up an agreeable acquaintance here in Lord George Clinton, second son to the Duke of Newcastle. I thought at first he was in love with Hester by his close attention to me, but I believe he was only seized with the present rage among young men of following a woman of sense, as they phrase it. The pretty girls are so empty. No society pleases me but a woman of sense. A lucky folly, at least. Nor should I call it that, but I concluded affectation in this boy. However, it may be genuine, perhaps, as he thinks it is. 4. Mr. Johnson's criticism of Gray displeases many people. Sir Joshua Reynolds, in particular, he professes the sublime of painting, I think, with the same affectation as Gray does in poetry. Both of them tame quiet characters by nature, but forced into fire by artifice and effort. The time will come when some cool observer will see, or some daring fellow venture to say, of Sir Joshua's Ugolino, all that Johnson has been telling of Gray's Bard. 5. 10th of December, 1780 We have got a sort of literary curiosity amongst us, the foul copy of Pope's Homer, with all his old intended verses, sketches, emendations, etc. Strange that a man should keep such things. Stranger still that a woman should write such a book as this, put down every occurrence of her life, every emotion of her heart, and call it Thraliana forsooth. But then I mean to destroy it all wood and wire behind the scenes sure enough one sees that pope laboured as hard quote, as if the stage rate or looked each line unquote. indeed and how very little effect those glorious verses at the end of the eighth book of the iliad have upon me when one sees them in all their cradles and clouds and light changed for bright and then the whole altered again and the line must end with night and oh dear thus quote, torturing one poor word a thousand ways unquote. johnson said tis pleasant to see the progress of such a mind true but tis a malicious pleasure such as men feel when they watch a woman at her toilet quote, see by degrees a purer blush arise unquote. wood and wire once more wood and wire End quote. the following remarks about edmund burke the sainted burke canonized by lord morley may be read with some surprise and certainly it is rather a shock to hear such startling tales of the comparative sobriety of the gentlemen of wales perhaps however it is wrong to judge the welsh country gentleman by peacock's headlong hall but we cannot dispute that Mrs. Thrale, quote, stayed in the house, unquote, at Beckhamsfield, and that Burke was Irish. Mrs. Thrale is composing description and verses for the portraits by Sir Joshua in the library at Streatham. And when she comes to Burke, writes as follows, quote, "'Tis now time to turn over a new leaf for the great orator, Mr. Edmund Burke, who after I had ran from gentleman's house to gentleman's house all over Wales in the year 1774, was the first man I had ever seen drunk, or heard talk obscenely, when I lived with him and his lady at Beaconsfield among dirt, cobwebs, pictures and statues that would not have disgraced the city of Paris itself, where misery and magnificence reign in all their splendour and imperfect amity. Note, Irish Roman Catholics are always like the foreigners somehow, dirty and dressy, with all their clothes hanging as if upon peg. That Mrs. Burke drinks as well as her husband, 
and that their blackamoor carries tea about with a cut finger wrapped in rags must help to apologise for the severity with which i have treated so very distinguished a character End quote. in mrs thrale's welsh diary published by mr broadley in nineteen hundred and nine the remarks on burke are much milder there is much less detail about dress in thraliana than we should naturally expect to find but the following passage shows the natural pleasure felt by mrs thrale at the sensation created by a striking costume and it shows that the lady was before her age in consideration for the press Quote, my name has figured finely in the newspaper on account of my going to court on the birthday in the owyhee pattern silk the truth is i had a mind partly to please the burneys whose captain brought me some curiosities from the south seas and new discovered regions particularly a scrap of cloth torn from the back of the indian who killed captain cook with his club this stuff i thought so pretty that i got car the mercer to imitate it in satin and trimmed it with feathered ornaments to keep up the taste of the character still preserving in view the fashion of the times it was violently admired to be sure and celebrated in all the papers of the day which i have a notion was owing to my own willingness to be looked at by the people who sat in the guard-room observing dresses fashions etc my being used to electioneering prevents my indignation from boiling at the sight of a few honest fellows collected together which the tom folks call a mob so i turned to them and smiled and i heard them say tis mrs thrale oh she's a good-natured lady etc and so they put me in the news i guess End quote. several of her friends are going abroad and she makes the following entry quote, i catch myself thinking that if my master was to die and queenie to marry i would take my two next girls and give them a little run upon the continent before the time of flirtation should arrive as schoolgirls are dangerous animals enough at fourteen or fifteen years old ignorant of every earthly thing but their lessons they are a natural prey to all who venture the attack and the fortune of my monkeys will induce attention like the white feather in henri cat's hat on the day of battle End quote. Here follows an extract which shows really affectionate feeling, though it is possible that Mrs. Thrale took a pleasure in writing it, for it is very well expressed. Quote, One page more, I see, ends the third volume of Thraliana. Strange farrago as it is of sense, nonsense, public, private follies, but chiefly my own, and I, the little hero, but who should be the hero of an Anna? Let me vindicate my own vanity, if it be with my last pen. This volume will be finished at Streatham and left there. My poor little old aunt at Bath is dying, and I am dull enough to be sincerely sorry, the more as her past kindnesses claim that personal attendance from me which Mr. Thrale will not permit me to pay her poor little old insipid useless creature may god almighty in his mercy pity receive and bless her as a most inoffensive atom of humanity for whom his only son consented to be crucified and among whose flock she has most innocently fed for sixty or seventy years here closes the third volume streatham monday the twenty ninth of january seventeen eighty one End quote. End of section two. Section three of Mrs. Piozzi's Thraliana by Charles Hughes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As this is not a life of Mrs. Thrale, readers may be referred to Boswell, Hayward, or Mr. Seeley for an account of Thrale's death, the appointment of executors, and the sale of the brewery. The use of Streatham House and the income from £50,000 were left to Mrs. Thrale. 
Most of the important passages in Thraliana are in reference to her gradual attachment to Beodzi, her determination to marry him, and then her resolution to send him to Italy and give him up for the sake of her daughters, were communicated to Mr. Haywood by Mr. Salisbury. But the love tale is told in full by Mrs. Thrale, and it is only in Thraliana that it can be read in full. Miss Burney was the confidant, though she was opposed to the Piozzi marriage, she did not approve of Mrs. Thrale marrying a man who was a foreigner and a Roman Catholic, but seems to have behaved with sympathy and discretion. It is curious that she should herself have afterwards married Monsieur Dable, who was also a foreigner and a Roman Catholic. Mrs. Thrale had left Streatham, which was let to Lord Shelburne, the Prime Minister, and when she gave up Piozzi, retired to Bath with her daughters. Her constancy to Piozzi remained unimpaired. They wrote to each other, and she frequently sent him verses, which do not seem to have cooled his affection. Early in 1784, her daughters took pity on her. She was very ill, and was in truth dying of love for Piozzi. So Miss Thrale wrote to Milan to recall the Amante Adorato from his banishment. During this period, she is too much agitated to write much on general topics, but the following passage in Thradian restated at Bath on March the 15th, 1784. Quote, to neglect or forbear the education of our children is surely not the fault of the present age, Every boy is driven into the lists of literature, where indeed failure is now hardly a disgrace. So many and so impotent are the claimants for fame. Every female is harassed with masters she disregards, and heaped with accomplishments which she ought to disdain, when she reflects that her mother only loads her with allurements as a rustic lays bird lime on twigs to decoy and catch the unwary traveller. Like that... Too, it is often laid on so unskilfully that man and bird flies instinctively away. Their intention appears so very palpably. Yet is education at last an admirable thing. End quote. The marriage takes place on the 25th of July, 1784, and on September the 3rd she enters in Thradiana this heartfelt expression of satisfaction. Quote, I have now been six weeks married, and enjoyed greater and longer felicity than I have ever yet experienced. To crown all, my dear daughters Susanna and Sophia have spent the day with myself and my amiable husband. We part in peace and love and harmony. And tomorrow I set off for the finest country in the world, in company with the best man in it. End quote. And so for Italy, leaving behind Johnson, who behaved very badly indeed with reference to her marriage, and for whose conduct towards his benefactors there is no sufficient excuse, and hardly any palliation. I give the following extracts from Thradiana about her travels. Quote, Paris, 23rd of September, 1784. The Count Torcone a hump-backed Italian nobleman who lives always here to enjoy that liberty which great cities are sure to afford, has offered his house near Milan for us to inhabit, while he studies life all day and chemistry all night among the Parisians. I was diverted with the account of the people he lives with and whom he does not love. But anything, says he, is better than etiquette and insipidity so I keep clear of Milano at least and pass my life in the manner I best like." Unquote. He seems to esteem me, and so indeed do all the Italians I have yet been introduced to. Goldoni dined here one day, and we struck fire vastly well. He's such a looking man as the famous James Harris of Salisbury, and extremely garrulous. The Italians talk a great deal but he out-talked them all. 
She hears on the 25th of January of Johnson's death, which had been long expected, and writes, quote, Oh, poor Dr. Johnson. Unquote. But she is herself very happy. Quote, 27th of January, Milan, 1785. Here am I, with my husband and his friends, passing my birthday, after all past anguish, in the bosom of friendship, love and good humour. With my health recovered, as far as it was recoverable, and even my looks repaired by growing fat, so as to content my ever partial, my ever kind companion. What blessings, what comforts are these, and how grateful ought I to be for a change so unhoped for, though always eagerly desired. We have a dinner and a concert, and I am fed with flattery even to repletion. But that, of course, which most delights my heart is the unfeigned pleasure which I see my Piozzi takes in my company. God has heard my prayers, and enabled me to make happy the most amiable of his sex. Was I to wish for more, I might provoke Providence to lessen the enjoyments I possess. Let me suppress all inordinate desire of a child by the man I so love. That only could add to my happiness. So passes the happiest birthday ever yet experienced by Hester Lynch Piozzi. End quote. Though she finds the Italians pleasant and amiable, she is much disgusted with their customs and superstitions and the grossness of their talk. Quote, I told Piozzi the other day that I thought Senator Morosini's talk was like nothing I ever heard of but a midwife's evidence in England upon a trial in a court of justice. I have always been partial to Peter as elder brother, though I acknowledge him neither for padre nor monsignor, but I shall now be a follower of dear Martin as much from preferences from being born and educated where his heaven-dictated reformation is the established church. These people, by treating my notions as heretical, have made me a Protestant in despite of myself, who always used to say that, though I dissented from the Roman Church, I did not protest against it. But when they profess to worship man instead of God, it is time to protest against such gross impiety. No, sir, I said to a priest the other day, you do not pay divine honours either to saints or to angels, you respect them. On the contrary, madam, replied he, we adore them, and so we do the Pope, and it is heresy to oppose that adoration. Here I finished, and resolved never to speak to them on that subject more. Could I but separate my Piozzi from these goats? End quote. Having seen Venice, Rome and Naples, they returned to Milan. Quote, Milan, Casa Fedele, 27th of June, 1786. Such happiness I had once in the company of dear Dr. Johnson, whose knowledge of the world I now find to be nearly intuitive, excepting only that he could never persuade himself to think mankind so wicked as I have since found them to be, the anecdotes of his life, written by me in various parts of Italy, begun here in Milan, continued at Florence and finished at Leghorn, met, I understand, an extremely favourable reception in England. So I ought to be thankful and in good humour with my own country now, for every reason. Indeed, comparing it with others, one must allow it a gainer, though vicious enough, God knows, our Beckfords and Bickerstaffs do not keep their male mistresses in triumph like the Roman priests and princes. This Italy is indeed a sink of sin, and whoever lives long in it must be a little tainted. England certainly does keep the golden mean, and though wickeder than one would wish it, and more defective both in faith and works, I verily do believe it is the best part of Europe to live in for almost every reason. 
16th of August, 1786, Milan. I have seen a stranger thing, however, here at Milan, than any critical studies can afford. Nature and her varieties are better worth studying, after all, than all the other sciences, could one acquire them. Dr. Johnson once said, Nobody ever saw a strange thing, and challenged two or three friends, myself amongst them, to say I had in my life been witness to a sight justly called a strange one. But I had not then seen Avocato Borghi, a lawyer of this town, and a man well respected, who actually chews the cud like an ox, which he did in my presence and at my request. He is eminent for strength. His person, like that of another man till stripping, he shows a set of ribs and a sternum very surprising indeed, and worthy the inspection of anatomists. His body, on a slight touch, even through his clothes, throws out electric sparks. With all these peculiarities, no man has better health, I'm told, and he is eminent for lifting great weights, holding a man in the palm of his hand and such tricks. He can throw up his meals at pleasure, and to oblige me did go through all the operations of eating, masticating and vomiting, so as to entirely satisfy all curious inquiries I could make, and leave me no doubt of the fact which I would not have believed from the relation of any mortal now living. I could hardly have refused credit to Johnson. The Americans have got a trick of travelling, I find. It is very foolish in their government to suffer them. They will get spoiled. Note. The above remark is inserted in Thradiana without preface or comment. Have the Americans been spoiled or improved by continental travel? End note. 3rd of September, 1786. I am exceedingly obliged to the Milanese nobility for their partial regard and tenderness towards me, whom they consider as entitled to every distinction both by my birth and acquirements. But though they respect my fidelity to the man I have married, they scruple not to declare their opinion of its being very ill bestowed. All the gentlemen loudly proclaim their envy of Mr. Piozzi, and astonishment at his good luck in getting for his wife a dame di nascita. Note, he was not cavaliere, end note. Every man I have seen almost has made love to me. But when I found how the land lay, a steadily kept resolution never to sit with any man alone even for five minutes, settled that stuff completely. The Italians are sad liars. I would not trust one of them. These old priests teasing me to change my religion is the worst thing. I am afraid of their making Piozzi hate me, and of their putting a woman about him to keep him steady in the good old cause. Milan, 15th of September, 1786. Well, I am now about to close my residence in Italy at the same moment as I close my fourth volume of Thraliana and must confess that no days since I began it have been so happily spent by me as those I have passed in this beautiful country, where my little talents have been respected much beyond their deserts, my conduct extolled far beyond its merit, and my conversation sought for from the mere prevalence of true admiration and esteem. I shall not leave people who deserve so much from me, without sincere desire and fervent prayers for their future welfare. With regard to my husband, it is difficult to express how kind and how attentive he has been. May that tenderness not lessen from an idea that when I am once in England I shall need it no longer. For to that I shall owe my life, which depends entirely on him, and which his company can alone render pleasing in any nation and beneath any sky. Here then, farewell, fair Italy, say I, whilst other modes and other climes we try. End quote. And so they left Italy, where Mrs. Piozzi wrote her little book, 
anecdotes of the late Samuel Johnson, LLD, during the last twenty years of his life, she sent the manuscript to England for publication by Cadell, and as it was the first book she had published, its great success and numerous editions gave her much satisfaction. End of section three. Section four of Mrs. Piozzi's Thraniana by Charles Hughes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The following entry in Thraniana after their return home is made on April the twenty ninth, seventeen eighty seven, and will explain Mrs. Piozzi's feelings. Quote, Vienna pleased Mr. Piozzi better than me. He found some musical houses very much to his taste but I disliked both the city and people exceedingly. Prague was horrible. Dresden won my heart. Was I sixty years old, I should like to settle at Dresden. The Bloomsbury Square and Southampton Row are somewhat nearer, to be sure. The manners very similar. The society just such, I think. More women than men, and the men poor creatures. I made some friends, female ones, there who appeared to love me sincerely. Brunswick, Hanover and Osnaburg form a climax of misery. God keep them from ever seeing those places again. Berlin and Potsdam were superbly dull. The gallery at Dusseldorf is worth running across to look at, but Aix-la-Chapelle was a wretched place, and the spa baths made one sick to look at them. Brussels. I Brussels was something like indeed. Never were people so caressed as Mr. Piozzi and I were at Brussels. The Duke and Duchess of Arenberg quite adored us. Lord and Lady Torrington professed themselves jealous of our fondness for them. The Princess Governante invited our further residence in her city, and asked me if nothing she could do would induce us to stay. The Archduchess has learned English out of my book, Johnson's Anecdotes, and Prince Albert would not have Mrs. Piozzi out of his sight. We entertained sixty-four English friends with a concert and supper at the Hôtel d'Angleterre, and dined and spent the evening with the first company every day, and we left them, much to my regret, after spending five weeks in gaiety and good humour. Why did we leave them? I never could tell, certainly, but the best reason was the hope of seeing the mortgage to Miss Thrales fairly discharged and cancelled. That satisfaction I expect next Thursday. As for seeing our daughters, why, we never do see them here, any more than when the sea parted us, or hardly. The eldest has called twice, and we have called twice on Susan and Sophie, who refused dining here at our invitation, perhaps from the idea that they are superior to the petty sovereigns of Germany. End quote. For twenty-five years, Mrs. Piozzi lived in happiness and content with her second husband, who died at Brinbella, note the villa built by Piozzi on his wife's land near Denby, end note, in 1809. They never went abroad again, no doubt because the French Revolution and the constant warfare which resulted from it were interferences with travelling and especially with visits to Italy to which Englishmen have been so much inclined from the time of Henry the Eighth, visits for study and pleasure that seemed almost a necessary part of a polite education. Suffice it to say that Mr. and Mrs. Piozzi returned for a time to Streatham, and afterwards made their headquarters in Wales, on Mrs. Thrale's ancestral estate, and that Mr. Piozzi delighted his wife's heart by being received into the Church of England. They became very friendly with the Kembles, and especially Mrs. Siddons, and I cannot do better than quote a somewhat surprising comparison of Mrs. Siddons and Mrs. Pritchard, 
especially as Mrs. Piozzi was well aware that Mrs. Pritchard was stupid off the stage and knew nothing of the play of Macbeth except her own part. 11th of January, 1789, quote, Campbell is an agreeable actor, a very sensible and pleasing man. I love him and his charming sister sincerely, but have more sense than to take them for Garrick and Mrs. Pritchard. It is a shame even to have them compared. Mrs. Pritchard was incomparable. Her merit overbore the want of figure. Her intelligence pervaded every sense. She was the most refined coquette of quality in Sibber's Lady Betty, the most vulgar and cunning jade that Ben Jonson could invent in Doll Common, the loftiest Roman matron that Shakespeare could conceive in Coriolanus's mother, the most subtle and artful Millward that Lillo could imagine, capable of inducing the young and innocent prentice boy, the tenderest, the most instinctively tender parent that Voltaire or his translator Hill could give us in Merope, the softest and most subdued penitent that Rowe could exhibit in Jane Shaw. Dear Siddons represents only a lover distressed or a woman of virtue afflicted with peculiar happiness. Elwina, Belvedere, Dianora, Mrs. Beverley, her powers are strong and sweet, vigorous and tasteful, but limited and confined. I always thought Pritchard superior to Garrick. He felt her so in one scene in Hamlet, one of Macbeth and one of the jealous wife, when all the spontaneous applause of the house went to her. 1789, 8th of May. Mrs. Siddons acted Juliet last night. She does it naturally, says someone. So artificially, rather, said I. But she is a great performer. The parting scene with old nurse was the cleverest thing I ever saw. So pretty, so babyish, so charming. Kemble slept over the parting scene in Romeo. He is like Bottom the Weaver. He likes the tyrant's vein or Oakley's vein or a part to tear a cat in, as Bottom says. I never can keep clear of the idea for my part. A lover is too condoling for our friend Kemble. He is a clever man, though, and makes some capital hits in many capital characters. I wonder if my executors will burn the Thraliana. End quote. Mrs. Siddons is such a very great personage in the world of acting that I will quote some more passages, by no means all, in which Mrs. Piozzi mentions her, for we must remember that they became very intimate. Quote, 17th of May, 1790. Charming Siddons has spent some weeks with me, I think mighty well of her virtues, and am amazed at the cultivated state in which I have found her mind. She is a fine creature, body and soul, and has a very distinguished superiority over other mortals. Poor, pretty Siddons. A warm heart and a cold husband are sad things to contend with, but she'll get through. 1st of March, 1791. I think Mrs. Siddons, though beautiful, and endowed with talents not to support only but enrich her family, is a woman by no means particularly beloved, either by parents, husband, brother or son. They all like to get what they can out of her, but all the affection flows from her to them, not from them to her. I guess not the reason, but Five thousand women are better liked by their families. End quote. In seventeen ninety four, while living at Streatham, her youngest daughter Cecilia attracted many admirers, among others Samuel Rogers, whose life might have been very different had he married Mrs. Piozzi's daughter. As it was, he became a famous host and literary figure and at one time might be said to be the representative of literature in London, as Dr. Johnson was fifty years before him. Mrs. Piozzi's entry is, quote, 
Mr. Rogers has proposed to Cecilia. He seeks not her fortune, certainly, but he is too ugly to hope acceptance. Who but himself could fancy she would think of him, although banker and poet? She wants neither money nor verses, I suppose, and like the girl in the comedy, would rather have a husband with white teeth. End quote. It is amusing to find Mrs. Piozzi noting with some annoyance that Rogers gave up visiting them at Streatham after her daughter's marriage, so that it was clear to her that he had only come for the sake of Cecilia, and not for the charms of the mother's conversation. There is a great deal about the affairs of Cecilia, both before and after her marriage in Thraliana, and of some of it I can quite understand Mr. Salisbury's remark that, quote, it is for too private and delicate character to be submitted to strangers. Unquote. As for the three elder daughters who lived apart from her from the time of her marriage with Piozzi, there was no real intimacy, though the mutual feeling became less unfriendly as time went on. But Mrs. Piozzi had no tolerance or patience for anyone who did not appreciate and respect her dear husband. She was not merely a devoted wife, but found her chief happiness in being a devoted wife to the husband who had given her a second existence of exceptional harmony. Murphy, who had been the man to introduce Johnson to the Thrales, was the old friend for whom her liking remained unimpaired, and with whom she could enjoy a talk about the old times. One passage in Thraliana enables me to make a correction to previous writers. Johnson once made an improvised paraphrase of some Italian verses by Baretti. Long may live my lovely Hetty, always young and always pretty, always pretty, always young. Live my lovely Hetty long, always young and always pretty, long may live my lovely Hetty. And both Hayward and Seeley have described these verses as a compliment to Mrs. Thrale. Mrs. Piozzi writes, April 3rd, 1794. Who would dream of poor Dr. Johnson's verses in praise of my eldest daughter when she was ten years old, done to divert Baretti by anglicising his song at the end of the baby dialogues, coming out now, set to music for the missus to sing? Long may live my lovely Hetty, always young and always pretty, etc., etc. End quote. Footnote. Hayward says... She made a note for Sir James Fellows in 1816, quote, I heard these verses sung at Mrs. Thomas's by three voices not three weeks ago, end quote, end footnote. In justice to Hayward and Seeley, we must say that in the anecdotes of Dr. Johnson, from which the verses are quoted, Mrs. Piozzi does not say in whose honour they were composed. Now that we know, we can easily see as probably Haywood and Seeley could have done, that internal evidence should have told us at once that they were not meant for Mrs. Thrale. Boswell was constantly carping at Mrs. Piozzi's accuracy and correcting her in trivial things. It is curious to find that in 1794 he had a great controversy with Miss Seward in reference to some early verses of Johnson's about a sprig of myrtle. Strange to say, Boswell in this controversy was maintaining the accuracy of Mrs. Piozzi's account of the origin of these verses. If we find this passage in Thraliana, quote, Mr. Boswell and Miss Seward are good antagonists for each other, made on purpose, one would think. I wonder which will have the last word about poor dear old Johnson's sprig of myrtle. Boswell's cause is best, certainly, but his opponent outrights him. Miss Seward has ten times his power. End quote. Boswell had committed the unpardonable sin of writing with want of respect about Piozzi and adopting Johnson's attitude of reprobation about the Piozzi marriage. Mrs. Piozzi, having lived so many years with an Italian artist and travelled in Italy in his company, knew Italian ways as few English women did, and yet kept her English point of view. 
The following passages concern matters about which people in the 18th century wrote more freely than we do, and both of them have a biographical value. The first relates to, quote, Henry the Ninth, unquote, the last of the Stuarts, and the second to a lady artist, the wife of a famous painter. Quote, I might have heard similar stories to the tales in Suetonius about the Roman emperors in Italy all day, had I not hated lewd conversations as I do. Old Cardinal de York kept a catamite publicly at Rome while I was there, though a man of the best character possible for piety and charity, with which, as a person said to me, that vice has nothing to do. They consider it a mere matter of taste. When Mrs. Cosway ran madding all over Europe after a castrato, leaving her husband a newborn baby at home here, she was praying at every altar and fasting vigorously all the time. A hypocritical hussy, say the people. Not at all. Her faith is not influenced by her actions, I suppose. She was well persuaded of heavenly truths, although a prey to almost infernal passions or appetites strangely depraved. Her taking the veil at Genoa, after all, corroborates my opinion of her piety. Had I been abbess, though, and known her character, she should not have set foot in my convent. The nun's morality would be endangered by such a companion. Side note of Mrs. Piozzi's. She went en pension. She did not take the veil. End note. Mrs. Piozzi's books, Anecdotes of Johnson, 1786, and Letters to and from Johnson, 1788, were both very successful, for the public, or rather society, interest in Johnson lasted for many years after his death. Her account of her Italian journey, 1789, is lively and brightly written, and very much more readable today than most 18th century books of continental travel, these two volumes compare very favourably indeed with the four volumes of travels by her old enemy Baretti, which were so extravagantly overpraised by Johnson and for which Baretti received five hundred pounds from the booksellers. These books were written because Mrs. Piozzi had something to say. She had things to relate which nobody else could know. And she told her story in a headlong, lively manner that is a near approach to the familiarity of conversation, and has absolutely no relation to the stiff dignity of Johnson's prose style. I am glad to notice that Sir Walter Raleigh, in his chapter on, quote, Johnson without Boswell, unquote, says of Mrs. Piozzi, quote, It is impossible to read the anecdotes without falling under the spell of her easy, irresponsible charm, unquote. And the essential truth of her picture of Johnson is not vitiated by unimportant errors of detail, brought into an undue prominence by the genius of Boswell. But Mrs. Piozzi's later literary career is not so fortunate. Her British synonymy, produced in 1794, and sold by the mediation of Murphy and the repute of her former books for £500, was in no way a success, though it was not without some amusing passages. As for her last work, she relates in Threadiana that when she came to London in 1801 with the manuscript of two folio volumes, Retrospection or a Review of the Most Striking and Important Events, Characters, Situations and Their Consequences, which the last 1800 years have presented to the view of mankind, she found the publishers quite resolved not to pay for such a book. She was glad to come to terms with Mr. John Stockdale of Piccadilly on the terms that, quote, Stockdale bears me harmless of expense, and then we share the profits, which will be none. Unquote. She adds the further remark, quote, My bargain with Stockdale pleased nobody, I think. Unquote. My interest in Mrs. Piozzi has induced me to buy these two folio volumes, and I may say that in the later part of the second volume, 
her comments on the extraordinary events of her own time have some human and almost historical interest, though they are very awkwardly expressed. That is the best I can say of them. With regard to Thraliana, I should like to adopt the phrase of Professor Raleigh and say that in the reading of it, I have fallen under the spell of Mrs. Piozzi's easy, irresponsible charm. The specimens I have given may or may not bring this home to those who have not had the privilege of dipping into Thraliana for themselves and reading in her own handwriting the sincere and private records of a remarkable woman. Sometimes it is so intimate that one feels as if, quote, profaning the mysteries of the bona dea, unquote, to use a convenient phrase employed by Lord Beaconsfield. The full flavour can only be obtained by a full perusal. It is a voracious document, the real thing, the genuine article. My endeavour has been to give fair samples, not to expurgate unduly, and to try to convey to others the historical, literary and human charm of Thraliana. Dates in the life of Mrs. Piozzi 1741, Hester Lynch, Salisbury born, January the 27th, daughter of John Salisbury of Bach Crag. 1762, death of her father. 1763, her marriage to Henry Thrale, brewer of Southwark and Streatham. 1764, birth of her eldest daughter Hester, afterwards Lady Keith. She bore Thrale twelve children in all. 1765, First introduction to Johnson, Thrale, MP for Southwark, 1766, Johnson became domesticated at Streatham, and spent henceforth much of his time there, usually the middle of the weeks, returning to his London house on Saturday evenings. 1769, Boswell's first visit to Streatham, 1773, death of Mrs. Thrale's mother. 1774, tour in Wales of the Thrales and Dr. Johnson. On their return, they visit Burke at Beaconsfield. 1775, in September, Mr. and Mrs. Thrale, with their eldest daughter and Johnson and Beretti, visit France, eight weeks abroad. 1776, death of the Thrales' eldest son, a boy of ten. 1778, First visit of Fanny Burney, Madame D'Arblay, to Streatham. 1780, Gordon writes, Thrale loses his seat for Streatham. First acquaintance with Piozzi. 1781, Death of Thrale, Sale of the Brewery. 1782, Streatham House led to Lord Shelburne. 1783, Piozzi sent to Italy, Mrs. Thrale retires to Bath. 1784. Marriage to Piozzi. Departure of Mr. and Mrs. Piozzi for Italy. Death of Johnson, December the 13th. 1787. Mr. and Mrs. Piozzi return to England. 1790. The Piozzis go to live at the old house at Streatham. 1795. They leave Streatham for North Wales to live on Mrs. Piozzi's ancestral estate. 1809, death of Piozzi. 1821, death of Mrs. Piozzi in May. She left his Welsh property to Piozzi's nephew, who took the name of Salisbury. End of section 4. End of Mrs. Piozzi's Thraliana by Charles Hughes.